Hello guys, welcome back to another episode of the NTA podcast and as usual with me is Josh. Hi there. And Big Pod. Hello. All right. Today we have a few short it's going to be a short one and the topics are going to be chill and we'll get right on it. All right guys. So the topic the first topic being what we do offline. Okay. When we don't we're not working on Linux and we're not doing any serious work. Well, uh I actually went through an adventure myself here very recently. Uh if if you guys have like uh, watched uh, like my YouTube channel, I posted a couple short videos about how my town got hit by a tornado. So, uh I went through a whole week without power or really any proper internet access. So, uh, I've been uh, delving back into reading books, like uh, this one right here. I'll have a link for this in the description, by the way. Uh, and then, you know, playing, like, trading card games like Magic the Gathering. Never mind, I got spirits, I've got goblins, I've got a burn deck. Uh, and uh, I've been petting the cat a lot, too. <laughs> uh, question, since, you're, uh, since you got back into books, I've been, uh, I've been getting back, slowly getting back into reading books, but since I can't read because I fall asleep very quickly, I got, I immediately got the audio books version. Uh, but have you read Dune? Uh, I have read Dune. I haven't read Dune in like over 10 years. So it's been a while. <laughs> I'm glad that they came out with the movie because now I kind of want to read the book again because it's like, I don't remember that happening. <laughs> because, because none of that ha well not none but a lot of that didn't happen in the books it's just hollywood's way of uh turning it into a hero movie well but at the same time hollywood doesn't have like the room of storytelling that like a novel has mm. <laughs> yeah. but i'm uh, reading reading books or listening to audio books uh got me into realizing how much they're connected to reality books can be because reading uh, or listening to june he talks about a lot of things that we're going through right now and he wrote those in the 70s and 80s like ai and how mankind it's because spoiler alert uh it takes place ten thousand years in the future after mankind has quit uh, anything AI related and technology related and computers and whatnot. So it's all just magic and sorcery. Yeah. So yeah, books. Uh, getting back into books is a good thing because it 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 makes us somewhat touch grass again, metaphorically speaking. Uh, because books paint a different uh, reality in a. Uh, it makes us understand reality through the eyes of an author. And I like that. I like that. And it, get, it makes us forget sometimes the hardships we're going through, like the thing that you just went through. And looking at pictures, like the pictures that Big Pod sent, well, you got to count your blessings, my man, because <laughs> looking at that, that ain't easy to go through. I'm just glad that uh, I was out of town when the tornado hit. <laughs> No, oh, yeah. That's why I count your blessings Lucky twice. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about you, Big Pot? So, my offline life, it's very limited and do much offline. Mostly, I listen to music on my phone, which I beforehand transfer on my phone or download, and I walk. That's good. A lot. That's, that's good for the health. Uh... Yeah. And, yeah, I I do read some books, mo mo but mostly I read ebooks because I find. Uh, you books... don't have a big sprawling bookshelf like what I have over here just off of camera. I, ha I have a big sprawling uh, bookshelf, but most of those are the books I don't want to read because they're mostly scientific in nature and oh, not, the, not the fun kind. Oh, it's reference books then. Okay. Kind of like that, yeah. So I mo I mostly read uh, like biographies and like books about uh, space flight. 
That's that, one that's... of my big passions. Well, you want to go to space? No, I, I just like space flight. Well, uh, if, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, William Shatner, Captain James T. Kirk from the Star Trek, the original series, is the yes. only cast member from Star Trek who has actually been to space. He has been to edge of space. Well, kind of. He's been uh, near space. Thanks to Jeff Bezos. There's still, still, still uh, people, depending on who you ask, what, there's still people still not sure whether that capsule went to space or not, because you have many definitions of what is space. So let's, let's not go through that. Uh, yeah, oh, come on. We right don't want to open that kind of worms. Yeah, we shouldn't. <laughs> L let's have a separate episode for that kind of worms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I also, sometimes I also read like uh, fantasy or um, fiction stories. So the, my favorite book is The Martian, by Andy Weir. It's, yeah. It's science and science fiction it's, together. It's what is it's known as like hard fiction. It, yeah. Hard well, science it's, fiction. It's kind of like Isaac like Asimov style. Yeah, it, it uses actual science to to fiction to make a fiction about it. So it it space flight 10 years in the future, but uses all the rules of physics we know today and all the yeah. all the all the knowledge you have today. Exactly like Isaac Asimov, art. because That's, Isaac Asimov did that exactly in his yeah. stories. It's one of the hardest ways to write a science fiction book and well he, he did a good job. Wow. Basically uh this is uh I didn't expect this, but we basically all three of us got into books one way or the other well, uh, offline. Uh, my my big benefit is that I live in a farming community, so like uh, high speed internet access is still a very recent thing in this area. So uh, that that's why I'm not I've the got... only one, dude. You're yeah, looking yeah. at one guy who still got four megabits down. Yeah. So, um, but I... uh, of course, unlike you you guys, this book that I showed earlier here on ca on camera is actually a fantasy novel. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about well, classic uh, swords, do... swords, dragons, and, fan and magic here. <laughs> well, I have a I have a whole collection of World of Warcraft ebooks. So some of those yeah. World of Warcraft books are actually really good. Yeah, like uh, certain ones, like, like from uh, Richard K Knack, are really good. The, the uh, what is the Sundering? What, uh, not Sundering. Uh, the War, uh, uh, War, War of, of the, the Ancients. Ancients. Yes, that that's yeah. a, that's a really good like beginner book. Like if you don't yeah. know if you don't know Warcraft lore, that's a good one to start. Another one is the Arthas novel. I think uh, that was written by Christy Golden. Yeah, she's also yeah. really good. That, at that that one's also a pretty good one, and it really does supplement. Like if you go back and and uh, play like Warcraft three and that storyline later, uh, yeah, that that supplements that game actually fa fairly well. Uh, and those are really the only two that I can immediately think about the top of the head that's, like, good for a new reader, which the Warcraft, the Warcraft lore, especially, like, the older lore, is actually very fascinating to get into. Same thing with, like, uh, yep. Mag Magic the Gathering or uh, Warhammer as well is, is fantastic. Or, you know, if, uh, say, you were a, a, a millennial gamer or somebody that played video games between the years of 2007 and 2014... Halo has a expansive novel series. <laughs> I don't think any would know be that. more expense, expensive there, than there Star are Wars and Star There are Trek. currently <laughs> something like 170 Halo novels. It is same, huge. Same, same, same as Star Wars. Basically. Yeah, same, same as Star Wars, but uh, all the Halo novels are still canon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, touche, touche there. But... Uh, Wow. Uh, so, uh, which brings me to one question: Do you uh, do you acknowledge the existence of Warcraft the movie, or that thing is abomination? Uh, uh, okay. it's abomination. Uh, Hank, it's a I separate mean, universe. If if we're gonna talk about the movies, uh, as somebody that has delved into Warcraft lore, I have to acknowledge that the movie does exist. Because the movie is actually accurate to an extent. Yes. The oh. issue with the movie is that they took so much of a time span and shrunk it. 
into what it, w- yeah. what should have been three movies essentially. Yeah, it, it should have been not three movies but six movies. That's how it much could, they, that's how much it, they compressed. It should, it should have been a whole season of a TV show. Yeah. Because you know the size of the size of like 24 episodes. The, the first 20 minutes of the movie, there's enough lore there that they could have made two movies out of it. Yes. That's basically what I'm but, saying. But but they, the, they just, the way you should look at the work of the movie it's an alternative universe. They have a whole whole idea of alternative universes where there isn't just the the main universe is one you're playing games and it is the main novels. But there are alternative storylines that they go through, whether it be through time travel or just alternative other Whoa. means of alternative travel. And that so that's where so- the movie lives. Okay, so basically, the movie should have been a multiple episodic uh, TV show because there's a lot of things missing or uh, compressed to such an extent yeah. that, that it made the movie for new for newcomers they wouldn't understand what Warcraft lore is yeah, all about and, because there's yeah honestly that, like even lore nerds uh, like you would have to be a lore nerd to understand that movie yeah. yeah. Uh, if you were just, just like, if you were the average World of Warcraft gamer, uh, you have no idea what the heck was going on because the entire movie predates I... World of Warcraft and Warcraft Three. Yeah, and and let's be clear: if if you really want to make a good like series, you would have to make two series, one of one of them on the war and one of them just on Khadgar. Yeah, <laughs> not that I <laughs> know what that is because I never. Khadgar played... is is one of the mages, so oh. the whole the whole movie. You know, there is a mage that has a, a lot of do and a like young mage. Uh, think of it. Th- <laughs> that's a whole series. Uh, think of it this way: Cadgar is like the mage that's not named Medivh. Yes, <laughs> the <laughs> other guy. Yeah, the other guy, basically. Yeah, the there other guy. Mages. That's Cadgar. <laughs> the only person in the family who actually played uh, Warcraft series minus World of World of Warcraft uh, was my dad. So. Um, uh, he knows better about Warcraft than I do, but I still didn't talk I, I, about what I do in offline, what I did offline, and what I do offline. Well, uh, other than the fact that I came back to YouTube, uh, and thanks to to Josh for letting me know of the mistakes I made with the new setup that I created <laughs> for today's uh, tomorrow's video, which will be addressed in future videos. Uh, other than that, I've been listening to Dune because I had the pleasure, and I I mean it from the bottom of my heart, I had the pleasure to have my cherry pop, my cinematic cherry popped, IMAX cherry popped. Yeah. Because it was the very first time I experienced a movie in IMAX, and not any IMAX, the 70 millimeter IMAX. Oh, the if, good one. If you, yeah, if you didn't, if you, if you don't know about uh, cinematography, I'm not gonna go into it, or else this episode will drag on for hours. Just suffice it to say that it's on 70 millimeter negative. That's rare to find these days, rarer than you think. Uh, I watched Dune Part Two in IMAX, and the experience was tremendous. It was the best experience, cinematic experience I've ever had, next to the the one where. My brother took me to watch The Clone Wars, one of the bad movies, but uh, in a cinema where they bring you your own food, you sit, the, the, the VIP cinema, basically. Uh, but still, VIP is not the same experience as IMAX, because IMAX, the screen, the sound, the, the shaking chairs, and, and all of that, and the music on that film by Hans Zimmer was top-notch. Yeah, I don't know what it is about Hans Zimmer in general, but it's just like uh, he's been on he like does. a big upswing lately with uh, movie music. Because the last time I heard his name was like The Last Samurai, which was like early two thousands. Wow, Holy he God. does really good. Like, I believe he did uh, like for the Batman trilogy. He, yeah, he's next like to that. John Williams. He's as uh, he's up there with John Williams. Well, I'm just looking at his. Uh, what he did, and just among awards, there are some really, really, really good movies. Yeah. Yeah, The Dark Knight Rises, like the music in that is good. The, uh, you have Dune. And I, I got, I got, I, I, I immediate when I got home from that movie, 
I bought the soundtrack right off the bat. I bought it. It was what twenty bucks. I got the the soundtrack in high res FLAC format because if you listen to it to MP3, you're not doing it just. You need to listen to it in high res uh, FLAC format because there are levels to his music that you can only li- uh, hear when you are listening to the uh, to the FLAC uh, format. Uh, and I've been ever since. I've been, uh, as I said earlier, I'm listening to the audiobook narrated by by audiobook start with so, sound uh, with music, sound effects, and everything. And not only that, I'm following the audiobook on the digital ebook because I even bought the digital ebook, all six of them. All two thousand five hundred pages of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. When you go into that, you can have a lot of books really quickly. It, n- there is no story other than Isaac Asimov, of course. The Tower from Isaac Asimov. That book just pulled me, d- destroyed me after I uh, I, uh, I saw uh, after I read it because I saw how everything he's re- he wrote about is happening today and same thing with uh, frank herbert's dune because if uh, once you start getting into the nitty-gritty of his books of the dune books you see a lot of subjects related to ecology a lot of subjects dealing with the dissolution of the whole hierarchy of the upper higher ups and the lower downs and and stuff like that it's 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 so complex and so real. It grounded me. So, wow. Yeah, wow, and, uh, wow, wow. If, if you're... So, like, as a disclaimer for, like, the science fiction uh, reader, if you've read a lot of uh, very recently published, I'm talking about, like, post-millennium uh, science fiction here specifically, if you've read a lot of those novels, uh, you have to remember that Dune was written 50 years before anything you've read so when dune came out a lot of these things they might sound like oh yeah you've i've heard uh ai horror stories in 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 uh before dune was like one of the first ones to come out with this stuff yeah yeah and And, honestly you don't have to read the entire dune series you can get you you can get by with just the first dune book oh yeah and but there's here's the thing uh i just finished the Messiah, Dune Messiah, uh, the second book. The uh, but I started the third book, and I'm like, what the heck? Did George Lucas carbon create, create a carbon copy of Dune? <laughs> well, you, you have to remember that Star Wars was by no means innovative, other than the technology that they used to film it. And George yeah, Lucas yeah. was never really a good storyteller. Exactly. <laughs> now, now it took all my fan, Star Wars fandom, r- put it in the trash, basically, because Frank Herbert is the one who came up with this whole twin brother and sister and the brother event- uh, wanting to be bigger and greater than his father type of uh, story arc. I'm like, oh. Well, let's let's be honest. The as far as I hear about this, like these story arcs have been going on for as long as books have been going I on. Mean, yeah. Like the hero's journey. That's that's a uh, Greek idea. I mean, I, I can point back to the Odyssey if you want the hero's journey. <laughs> yeah, by Omer. Yeah, like, <laughs> like fa- a family members fighting, like father and son fighting from Star Wars. That's that's a, that's basically Greek idea as well. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, we're... Basically, what we have been doing offline is basically reading books. So, <laughs> getting into the lore of uh, uh, of books, and this is very good for the mind to to disconnect from social media and all this digital nonsense, and developing and working on Linux and being part of this. I'm not gonna call it negative, but uh, mishmash of a Linux community. Uh, with its negatives and positives and having to deal with this and that being uh, touching grass from time to time is a really healthy thing to do 
Well, yeah. Even if it takes a tornado to, to shake us off our boots and get <laughs> us back into real life. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's basically what we've been up to uh, offline. Other than that, uh, we uh, you guys want to address uh, the feedback that we received recently on our first uh, couple episodes? Not quite yet, because uh, there, there's another topic I want I wanted to discuss first, and okay. uh, that's actually how we're actually running the this show. And uh, okay. so we're not paying a service to host a podcast for us or anything. Uh, you can search for us off of like uh, iTunes and find us there. We're, we even show up on Spotify and Amazon podcasts. But yeah, that's cool. They they syndicate from us, uh, as in we are self hosting this entire show. So we so we have absolute control over everything that goes on with this production. And yes, I am paying yes. for it out of pocket. <laughs> and and we have every chance to mess it up. Yeah, yes, we have exactly. every single chance to mess it up. So uh, you you may or may not notice uh, if you're like the RSS uh, subscriber and you're listening through like the podcast client. An episode might just randomly disappear or might just suddenly appear or, you know, you might see, like, an episode name change or update compared to, like, when you previously downloaded it. That's just because, you know, we're we're still very much in the process of figuring things out. And, uh, yeah. I'm, and uh, we're working on, like, the formatting of the show. But uh, generally, uh, if you look at, like, uh, the, uh, show, the show website... That's actually a self-hosted Castapod instance, which uh, Castapod has always been a service that I've always been interested in because prior to uh, Castapod, you were having to spin up a uh, the only other easy solution to self-hosting a podcast was to set up WordPress. And Big Pod, I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to manage a WordPress instance. Not only that, Neither do was, I. <laughs> there was another instance that, uh, that Spotify bought that was called... Uh, something me dot me or whatever it was called now it's part of spotify uh i used to use it for my podcast but since ever since it merged with with spotify it became a nightmare to manage that's why i called it quits yeah. that's one of the reasons i called it quits on my uh podcast among other reasons but castopod the first time i saw it was with the linux experiment nicola uh, one of my very good friends french friends uh he uses it, and I wanted to talk to you about uh, Castopod. If we can link directly to uh, the second tab instead of the first one, because for whatever reason on my phone, it doesn't allow me to play until I click the second tab. I'll find out if There's we can. A... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but other than that, uh, we're figuring, as uh, Josh just said, we're still figuring uh, things out. We still need to figure out our actual uh, schedule. Yeah. That's the important part. Uh, <laughs> scheduling that. is so something that uh, we're working on. Uh, but anyways, uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about like uh, the deeper dive on how we're hosting it. Uh, the the Castapod instance is running over a Kubernetes cluster that's uh, served from a single host. No, it's not. It's not? Okay, well, it's running... We, I switched out the architecture for a separate reason that it was just... A fix up for oh, okay. something that I should have known how to do. <laughs> well, anyways, I'm sure Big Pod can cover. Like, Soon the after, software. I realized yeah, uh, what Big, I did wrong. I, I'll I'll let Big Pod cover like the software stack here in just a minute. But uh, uh, it it is a it is a VPS being served over a VPS provider that you may or may not have uh, heard the name of before. Uh, the Akamai Connected Cloud. They are not a sponsor of the show, at least right now. And Hopefully they'll be in the future. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't mind some free hosting at least. <laughs> hopefully one day. Yeah, hopefully. But it, it is a second tier uh, uh, Linode system, which basically means that we got two CPU cores and a single gig of memory, and that's that's what's running this entire show. And uh, hopefully that's enough for us to scale a little bit. If we need to scale more in the future, I'm sure I'm certain we can figure out how to do that in the future. But uh, we'll yeah. keep you posted on that. And uh, if you have issues downloading the episodes, let us know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have a bit of a correction. It's, it is actually four gigabytes of RAM memory. It's four. Okay. Uh, I'm paying for a bigger yeah. server than I thought I was. That's fine. <laughs> uh, it's, but we're using, like at this point, we're using one gigabyte. 
Well, I got a smaller one for my VPS. It's it, it's half a gig. So, if you go into the software stack itself, it is uh, as, as I said, it uh, it's uh, Docker Compose. So, it's using containers across the board, and Castapod itself is PHP using uh, something called Code Igniter. And we're using uh, uh, what is essentially we're using a uh, direct IP to the server, so that might be a good or a bad thing. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and we're we're using S3 storage backer. At least we should be. We're still investigating we whether that is true or not, but we're gonna fix if it won't be true. <laughs> In, ca in case you haven't noticed, I'm the odd one out. I don't know anything about what these guys are talking about because I'm not the technical, I don't have the technical knowledge for any of that, uh, nor the financial uh, ability to do, to do any of that. So, uh, but I do have a role to play other than being the clown uh, is just to uh, be part of the trio who comes up with ideas of topics and stuff like that, so. Yeah, uh, before I forget, I forgot to mention one thing on the software stack. We have a secondary instance, a test instance uh, that is running on Kubernetes cluster, and that is my instance to uh, break that, and test closet. all the, <laughs> all the, all the fixes and amazing things that, ha that happen. And, uh, since Castopot is using uh, MySQL, on that instance, I'm using something called Vitesse, which is basically scaling the MySQL to n degree. Because, well, I wanted, wanted to get it to be as great as possible because it's testing so I can break it as many times as I want. Wait, wait, did you did you say Vitesse? Yeah. yeah. Vitesse translated is speed. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. It's... It is a technology that was originally created by YouTube. Oh, and YouTube. Okay. Yeah, YouTube Google. created... Well, I'm uh, certain that if uh, somebody wants to make something that scales, YouTube would be a great resource to pull <laughs> yeah. from. YouTube needed it. <laughs> and that was, I believe it was created before Google bought YouTube. Oh, by the three guys who originally uh, created... The... I believe it was a bit later than three guys, but yeah, when it was... Right, I mean, so... In between, basically. Yeah, yeah. In between, they wow. they need to scale to actual like world scale, and now Vitesse is managed by uh, or like it's open source, fully open source, and the main users of it are uh, are a company called Planet Scale, because literally the database is Planet Scale. Yeah. <laughs> so speed and Planet Scale. Wow, the vision yeah. is grandiose. <laughs> and. Maybe in future we're gonna gonna be at that scale. Maybe. Stay tuned to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned to find out. So basically, what uh, uh, what we're doing or they're doing uh, on the back end is, or basically Bigbot is doing, uh, is uh, what we do on Arch. Fuck around and find out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm trying to future proof uh, this whole. Endeavor. Yeah, because you know, one way or on another, back and side. Well, one way or another, we might need to either migrate to a different different service or a uh, scale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's for sure. Yep. Uh, but anyways, but... Uh, we got some feedback uh, very oh, yeah. recently. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, you're going to quickly find out like our episode backlog because this is feedback all the way for episode one. And uh, we got this from a guy that calls himself Eric from uh, the Weekly R Show. Uh, which yep. is another podcast. I, I our weekly. Uh, our weekly, yes, our weekly. Okay, but anyways, <laughs> uh, he goes by the handle of the R podcast on various social channels. I would assume that there's probably a YouTube of Mast. I I assume he found us through Mastodon. Uh, yep. And he wants to congratulate us on a first episode, which means that he was able to successfully <laughs> watch it, or stream it, or download it. <laughs> yeah. So something is working. Yeah, something works. <laughs> But anyways, uh, the very first statement that he says after that is, of course, 
he used to torment you in a Hot Shot Racing League, which I assume that there's a game called Hot Shot Racing, and he won the second yes. season. He just wanted to say that. Yes. Just wanted to say that. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he wa- he wanted to touch on the topic of the fra- of uh, fragmentation, which we d- we did discuss, and uh, w- w- we discussed it for like a good uh, amount of length too. Uh, yeah. Uh, my mind is blanking right now because I was just listening to episode two last night, <laughs> so I mm-hmm. my head is stuck on KDE talk still. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. That is but, a backlog. Yeah, yeah, but just backlog things. But anyways, uh, uh, I have no experience with uh, our language. Uh, the only language I have done any form of development in is Lua, which uh tells you a whole lot about programming that I know. But anyways, uh. It it's it R is used primarily for statistical computing, and it has over twenty thousand community packages. Which I believe there was like a single day where like they all got uploaded to the AUR and sent like R R users into like a panic or something like that. I remember I, I'm remembering like a Brody Robertson video about this for yeah. some reason. But any and. It's common for like uh, people to complain about knowing which package to use for a given method, and yeah, that is yeah, that's a standard problem. That for is many sta- languages. That is the standard problem of fragmentation. Welcome to JavaScript hell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. he did mention, and he did mention in the email that uh, his company where he was working at, they didn't care about free open source. They were just working on closed source uh, stuff, and the might yeah. and. It, and the fact that the migration to open uh, it took a lot of effort to get them to move to op- free uh, and open source uh, alternatives. Yeah. And how much of a hell that was, but in, uh, eventually, in the end, they they completely moved and migrated to open source, well, and they've been happy ever since. When it comes to migrating to like open source, I can completely understand why the company wouldn't care, because uh, yeah. I was very recently a stakeholder in business. I. Uh, that's a whole nother subject for another time. But, you know, any of the products that I made or sold, I probably would not release into the open source. Uh, because, you know, uh, we're talking about things like company secrets, like company practices that, you know, is basically just like not, none of your business uh, potentially yep. be getting out. Yeah. And I can understand that. And when it comes and- to software specifically... I can even potentially double down on that, because you know, uh, soft software is an infinitely reproducible product. As in, you know, if I publish the source code, now I can have another company that uh, downloads the source code, compiles it, and sells the exact same thing that I'm making, and I'm putting all of my development yeah. effort into. So yeah, and and uh, when it comes when it comes to free open source, and this is where the correlation with. Uh, fragmentation com- comes is with free open source comes fragmentation because there's so many languages available out there there's so many different environments out there there's so many so many of everything that you, you yeah. have to uh, it's costly it's extremely costly especially on a uh, on a large scale as companies to, to do to have to do the research to have to learn whatever they decide to use and send their employees and stuff to uh, to learn all these languages and uh, so it's 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 fragmentation is very bad especially when you when we're talking about the larger scale of things companies corporations and stuff yeah. like that and on the on the open versus closed source for companies, uh, d- directors or pro- procurement officers don't really care. All they care is whether whether software works. And on one hand, if you pay somebody, you at least have somebody to blame if it doesn't, or somebody to fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that you have in either case, but you have somebody outside to blame and possibly possibly lodge a complaint at because in open source. Who are you going to lodge a complaint that when the, it's a, a, a random group of people is making a program? Uh, yeah, the bug tracker. There is no no co- no corporate entity, no nobody you can you can like sue in that so basi- kind of way. I mean, so lodge a complaint that. So basically, when we we shouldn't 
uh, make fun of companies that refuse to use open source. We, we yeah, need to, uh, what, because I see this a, a lot on social media. On social media, since we are more inclined, we use social media for our day-to-day -day stuff, uh, I see a lot of people making fun of companies who refuse to use free open source software. They don't look at the bigger picture. And that's something people they should don't stop see. Doing. They don't see how how people inside companies have to think. Yeah. For them to stay, to stay where they are, for them to be able to do their job, or and not risk getting fired just because a piece of code, or because somebody changed a piece of code on them, without their without them having somebody to blame for it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Just, just remember, the default state of a business is to earn money. Yes. Yes. That, that is exactly. Their, that is their eternal goal. Because they, if, they're, if they're not making money, they're either a charity or they're not a business. Exactly. Yeah. And with that, we need to transition to the final topics, uh, since uh, my colleagues here have a lot to do after this. Uh, okay. So uh, oh, for the last topic here, it's just a reminder that you probably should probably consider updating your systems, or you know, not using Arch Linux. But anyways, uh, there has been a critical uh, vulnerability was that a jab found. At me? Well, of course was that it was. Of course it was. Yes. Yeah. You, you okay. accept it. You said that you use Arch Linux, so you know I'm going to, to tell you. Uh, anyways, okay. anyways, uh, there's been a there's been a vulnerability found in XZ which works in a very roundabout way, which hooks to systemd notify D, which can then apparently interact with like your SSH session. SSHD, yeah. Yeah. It interacts yeah. with SSH. And, uh, lib LZMA. Lib LZMA. Yeah, so, uh, so it's not that SSH isn't secure. This is actually not SSH's problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's problem of uh, the fact that some some distros uh, change SSH in such a way that it allows receiving uh, system it D hooks no it notifies into lib LZMA. It, it hooks which it into system LZMA. D then uses lib yeah. LZMA, yeah. and what this vulnerability does, which is actually a supply chain attack because of how it happened, it actually just makes SSH the skip authentication or, or full authentication just skips it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, for the record, this only affects uh, XZ versions 5.6 and newer. So uh, yeah, if 5. you're 5.6.1. Yeah, so if you're using like an a long-term support release distribution like uh, say Ubuntu LTS, Debian, or anything like that, you're probably fine. <laughs> Yeah, and we talked uh, about it yesterday about how Ubuntu uh, managed to uh, bypass was, the whole issue. They yeah, renamed Debian. their package into five point six, five point six point one, or five point four. Five point six point one, really? Five point four point five. Yeah, I mean and it works. I have to say we are really lucky that this vulnerability was found. Yes, but there's a, there's a still a big question mark on uh, if just S SSHD is yes. uh, vulnerable or there's other things. They're still looking into it. But yeah. uh, uh, here's the thing. It's the co-maintainer of the project who injected that vulnerability. Yeah. In, yeah. And because the main maintainer is suffering from burnout, and he has been for the past few years, so he hasn't been maintaining the project. He was 100% re uh, relying on this uh, co-maintainer who, yeah. I don't know what went on in his head to start doing this, but whatever. Let's I, not I speculate think, on that. Uh, let's not speculate and too much about it. But uh, I'm not speculating. I'm just saying Let's whatever. not do any yeah. speculation on this topic. But I'm going to say, here comes my standard standard thing on open source security. If it's open source, it doesn't mean it's secure. I know 100%. what people people used to say, people or people say, no, that's not true. Because even if even if 10 people look at the code, maybe 10 people didn't see it. And the only time you can really be sure, and even then you cannot be really sure that we something are the beta is secure testers. We are if the you beta read. Testers. Yeah, and we are the at the end of the day we are the beta testers for uh, uh, for for the whole majority as we use as users 
of, of these products, we are the ones who end up being the beta testers. Maybe and... you, maybe you, not me. I, I, I use a normal distro. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I I think uh, I'm probably closer to a normal distro than the rest of you, simply because okay. Big Pod, your your oh. distro is using like that imaging thing that the yes. doesn't make any sense. And Steve, your distro is just being a savage. Yeah. In the meantime, I'm talking to you from Ubuntu. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, so now so now you you calm down from from your Gen two days. Uh no, I'm actually testing an Ubuntu uh, LTS pre alpha release. <laughs> Well, uh, well. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, we 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 make fun of Arch a lot, but this time around, they held their own weight and they fixed the issue mere uh, one less than an hour after the issue has uh, was announced. Good. They they released a, an update to the package. Now it's five point six point one dash two, where they uh, removed all the back doors and everything that was reported. Well, they just removed but they the code kept that was the, mentioned. Uh, well, they kept the binary, uh, the unaffected binary, because they built it from uh, GitHub instead of uh, building it from the yes. uh, from the tarballs, it, like every other dis, including so, Fedora does. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's standard practice for various reasons. I, as a packager, understand, and they are valid, no matter what people say, because Git does bring its own issues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but on our hand, tarballs bring their own issues. It's just that tarballs are better at checkpointing things than than using Git if the Git repository doesn't do checkpointing itself and, with tags. And, and to finish to, to 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 sum it all up, it's like Big Pod said, the the, uh, I'm, uh, the distributions Linux as an operating system, as a kernel, and as a whole is secure but that doesn't mean the no. software no let me finish it doesn't mean that the software you run on it can be secure it can be as insecure as it can be secure no yeah i disagree what why do you disagree default position should should be insecure uh, because like even even uh i read that kernel had a vulnerability this week when doesn't crawl have a vulnerability? Yes. So kernel has vulnerability. So it isn't, by definition, it isn't secure. There are holes in it. There are holes in anything. It and is what? just yeah. the question where those holes can be used. The operating system with the most holes is Windows. <laughs> I, uh, that could, that could I would be, be sure. Uh, the big benefit that open source has, though, uh, compared to Windows, is that the vulnerability is there, and there's more than just paid employees that are, that are tasked with looking at it. I mean, there is a benefit to yes. you know having somebody that is, that you literally pay to work on your software product. Yes, but, but you, but those drive-by committers, uh, as many issues as they bring with them, they can also potentially get an issue like that fixed potentially faster than the proprietary yes, solution. Yes, but at the same time, we should remember how long did it take for them to find Heartbleed. That's true. Years back, how how long did it take for them to find what was that the Java issue uh, with what was that library? Very very mu very very used library. Libc, you're talking about Libc. No, uh, no uh, Java library. Uh, What's called Faker JS. No, lo no, no, no logging no. logging library uh, for Java. Log for J. Log for J. Yeah. That one. How that as, as far as I remember, that was years in the. In there. Yeah. Ultimately, though, ultimately, and we mentioned this earlier, XE developers suffering from burnout. Maybe, yeah. maybe if you use an open source product all the time, you should consider hitting that donate button. Yes. Yeah. That's a but good way. To... Anyways, anyways. Uh, I want to say something else as well. Uh, if. If you're gonna treat any software any software differently between open source and proprietary, I I would say if you didn't read the source code, treat every open source software as proprietary, because there is no difference for you in that yeah. way. Because as the end user, yes, you have you have to then place implicit trust to to, to people you yeah, you just 
don't know. And it's exact same thing as with proprietary software at that point. Yeah, but people... only reason, only difference is that, that you with proprietary software, you don't have that ability to check the code. But if you didn't, what's the difference? Well, yeah, and, and people blindly trust corporations because th there's money behind there, it. There, there is somebody to blame behind it. There's, there's somebody who, who there's can, some who, there's somebody whose to reputation do this. can be hit. <laughs> there is somebody whose reputation can be hit. There's somebody who can who 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 has something to lose because yes. in open source that just not really it doesn't exist. Yeah, that it doesn't exist. I that can create a new GitHub account in minutes with a new name, new who will know that it's me. And speaking of which, I want to close with this one. Uh, it, Brody mentions it a lot in his videos, and we keep mentioning Brody. You need to go watch his videos. You, you will get. You will learn a lot. He's amazing at dive, diving deep into every single problem. He's willing deeper to dive, than we ever will. Yeah, he's willing to do it unlike us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. So uh, what he keeps uh, mentioning is: do not run bash curl commands. Do, you, you have to read the script before you yes. run uh, the the thing. This is a command I run for my toolkit, and. I'll be on on uh, on Thursday with uh, on uh, with Brody on his podcast, but I'm gonna be talking about that. Uh, when he mentioned he kept mentioning it, I felt like I need to say something about it. Uh, but the the fact is, yes, don't trust willy nilly any bash script that you you run blindly via curl commands unless you read the contents. If you're not willing, yes, because there's a lot of people I met online who talked to me directly, who messaged me uh, directly who are like, we don't want to learn. We don't have time to learn. We have, uh, our time is very precious. We need to be productive and time is money. So they wanted to move to Linux, but they didn't want to bother, bother learning all that things. That's why I say, if you're not willing, if you see a, a, a website asking you to run a curl bash command, do not run it. Do not trust it. Even mine. Yeah. Do not copy paste my bash command unless you you're willing to read the contents of the script and understand them yeah and my script is a simple bash script. and same would go for aur packages exactly sorry exactly. that's go. why you shouldn't be using aur helper because you you most likely will skip this or you know hit the option that's or you know use a uh, aur helper like uh what is it paru that forces you allows to you to skip the uh, pkg build well, yeah Show, yeah, he's the, yeah, he's the one that skips it by default, but Paru will actually default. Uh, Paru's default response to that is to actually show it to you. Yeah, if unless you right. configure it to not to show Good. it to you. Yeah, that's because right. there's a there's a flag called skip review. Uh, but because remember that package when it's installing, it's running as root. Yes, same thing and happened that's... recently to that person who. Whose home directory got deleted by a theme, by a KDE Plasma theme, uh, <laughs> because it was running a a, a JavaScript uh, in the, on the back end m intended for Plasma five, yeah. and he ran it on Plasma six, so it didn't do, uh, it didn't know uh, how what to make yeah. out of this command, so it ended up deleting his home directory. So <laughs> the summary here is, if you're not willing to look at the code, just don't run commands. Just use a distro like or, Ubuntu, or that, click install, done. That or you know, if you know a little bit about like using the terminal, and it, but you're afraid to like look at a bash script, I'm just gonna tell you this right now. A lot of bash scripts are really just a bunch of terminal commands chained together. So if yes, you if you yes. if you know how to navigate a terminal and do things in a terminal, just w get down uh, the the curl script and read and, it. and and read it and just take a minute. And and uh, look at it and go like, oh, this is just terminal commands being put in put into a script form. That yep. it's really that easy. And and now I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a secret. You know that a lot of fragmentation happens because of security. Yes. Because people see something they would like to have, they don't trust it, and they write their own version. Yeah, thanks, yes. OpenBSD. I am one of them. <laughs> uh, a, a very there are many things I rewrote the for servers that because I didn't trust the original or I didn't trust the author because I didn't want to read the whole source code because it was in a language I didn't know. 
that or you know fragmentation happens because you know somebody sees a problem that the original maintainer doesn't see and they want to fix it anyway a very very big example of this is actually nginx and apache yes (laughs) yeah and and the fact that i had to rewrite the profile section of uh, arch install because i didn't like the, the the profiles that arch install was providing so i had to write my own version for kde plasma yay Yay! Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, laid-back episode. It, it was amazing talking to the guys, not about Linux and Linuxy things, just talking real, real life stuff. Uh, I don't know about you guys. Did you did you enjoy this episode? Uh, I yeah. I never not have fun whenever I'm talking to Big Pod and you. <laughs> oh, oh, blush. <laughs> But anyways, uh, and this uh, this is the podcast. We we don't talk just Linux. No, we uh, talk about tech and everything related in uh, life. Yeah. If you might notice, I have not pulled out my penguin cup yet. Oh, hello, Tux. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Yeah, but any <laughs> anyways, anyways, guys, if you would like to give us feedback on the show and continue the conversation with us directly, you can always contact us by going by uh, sending an email to contact at tuxspace dot com. And that will that is a relay email that should forward to the three of us if it actually works, and hopefully we should be able to respond because, as far as I can tell, I got that fixed. That's another back end topic we didn't actually go to, <laughs> but I don't want to talk have... about how I fixed the email. <laughs> we, we we you might see you might see more about back end on on our channels, which can be found in. The description on YouTube and on our and on the Castopod show intro. notes, show notes on Castopod and everywhere else where, which, where show notes are shown. Or you know, if you're watching we, the video, you can at least shout us on, at these Mastodon links that uh, we're hopefully being shown right now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, guys, fingers crossed. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Episode four, of which we don't know what we're going to talk about yet, but hopefully we can figure out before you know the show actually starts. That's my job. If I do it correctly, we'll have some topics. <laughs> See ya. Yeah. See ya. See ya.